This week, in conversation with a couple of colleagues, actually, I learned some new things about these magi. And perhaps you biblical scholars already know these things, um, but maybe it would be fun to bring them up or to remind ourselves. I learned that in ancient times, the stars were split up into different, I don't know, constellation is the right word, but some were considered masculine and some were considered feminine. And so, astrologers included people of both sexes because certain stars needed women to check them out, <laughs> which I kind of love. Which gets me to another interesting conversation I had and gets me to wondering who, who these magi really were. Tradition says, of course, there were three men and has created little backstories for all of them. Perhaps you can even tell me their names and, and what we know, right? But as we heard in our scripture this morning, very little there. So, some might say that, as our own Reverend Rebecca Schroeder said, Schroeder, excuse me, reminded me that in some languages, and including the Greek, which is where our scripture comes from, if there is a group of people, and in that group of people, if one is considered a man or a male, the whole group uses a word that is masculine. So if there are 50 of these magi running around and 49 of them are women, but one is a man, we use the masculine word wise men rather than wise people or wise persons or... You get where I'm going with this? Okay, so you might ask uh, why that is and you know, men are just afraid of women's power, but that's okay, we can, we can talk about that another time. And this is all to say that this group of astrologers, of magi, were quite possibly a bigger group than just three. If they're wandering around from all over the continent and for some time, there's probably more than three of them and it's quite possible that they were a very mixed group and a lot more interesting even than those three guys that we, we see on Christmas cards. And they would have been very good at what they did because Magi went in groups and entourages and this is some, one of the things they did was wandering around and being emissaries to different places politically. And even though they were really good at what they did, they didn't have all the pieces to the puzzle. Their trail went cold in Jerusalem and they stopped and basically were like, oh, let's ask the king for some direction. And so they went in looking for help. And so let me read you that piece again. A magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. And King Herod doesn't know, but he calls, and here again I'll quote scripture, he calls together all the chief priests and scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. So the Magi were in luck because between the chief priests and the scribes, they had another piece of this big puzzle. And we can often get caught up in how bad and terrible a king Herod was, and he was. But we can also get caught up in that and forget that there was also good news in this story at the palace because within the palace halls. People who worked under him were not all tyrants, but faithful, faithful people trying to listen and learn and pray and earnestly find God in the scriptures and in their lives. And so these two groups of people worked together to try to solve a mystery and figure out a path forward. And this was a problem that required all of their skill sets and perspectives and experiences, and God was working through them and led them to eventually figure something out and go out again towards Mary and Joseph and the Christ child. You know, community is really at the heart of the story. People coming together to usher in the good news and testify to, goods, to God's good work. And yesterday, I witnessed our community 
coming together with many different perspectives and from different places and different pieces of the puzzle of who was Marsha Brumbaugh. Now, I don't know that yesterday we solved any problems. Grief is a process that cannot be solved per se, but we certainly came together and testified to God's light and to a beautiful star who was rising in the heavens. And this all got me thinking about epiphany and about star words in a slightly different way. Star words are a ritual or a prayer practice that has become very popular in Protestant churches in the past decade or so. And we've practiced and offered star words in worship for the past two years, and we're going to do it again today. And so for those of us who are new to the idea or perhaps want or need a refresher, here we go. We have a bunch of cards and they have words on them and they're in a basket. Oh look, why it's right here. <laughs> there's a star, there's a word. You get to take one home with you. I'm gonna put this one back in and mix them up a little bit. So there's uh, there's this basket, and I'm going to invite you to pick one up at random. And don't go looking in trying to find your favorite word, but just to pick one up and let that word be a gift and be a guide for you for this year. Now, the words are from a large bank, and I think I can say that there aren't any repeats from last year. But if you get a repeat, how interesting for you because I didn't see that coming. And you, how you want to approach this practice uh, is, can vary, because as I say, it's a prayer practice. Now, I would recommend you put this card somewhere where you can see it, on a desk or taped to a mirror, so that you can bump up against it regularly. You might assume you know exactly what this word means and why it has something to do with you and with God at the first, but I would guess that there are probably other definitions that maybe you haven't considered. Perhaps you're less of a contemplative or a word, wordsmith kind of person and more of a doer. And that's okay because when you get your word, maybe you come up with three actions that you think might be associated with this and then I would say pick one of those, put it on your calendar and see where that leads you. So. There's no right, there's no wrong. And I'm aware that sometimes you get a word that just doesn't feel right. And there's a part of me that wants to say, wrestle with that word. There's also a part of me that says, you know, sometimes it's not right. Has any, well, we're not gonna do that. I've received some gifts that just aren't right. I'm sure you have too. So, perhaps this is an opportunity for you to wrestle with that for a little bit, and then maybe in conversation with someone else to wrestle with that, and then pick a new word, one that, that will guide you to a new, a new positive place in your life. And this is the piece that maybe I'm seeing, not maybe, I am seeing differently this year. It's an expansion of my understanding of star words and prayer practices because I tend to focus on the gift being given and received in this relationship process with this word and me and God because I'm more of a mystic and definitely more of an introvert than some. And I am reminded by both yesterday's service and by our scripture this morning that we are not walking this journey alone. For some of us, our star word is going to need to be a part of a much bigger group process and conversation. So, I'm gonna also say to you this year, what if we checked in about star words, maybe before a team meeting, or maybe it becomes part of our coffee hour ritual. How's it going with your star word? Ugh, let me get a cup of coffee first, we'll talk later. <laughs> What if we invited close friends or even strangers to tell us about their thoughts on the word? You don't have to tell them why. You're just thinking the other day about this word. Please, what does that mean to you? How do you see it? 
What might they imagine? We can look up definitions and listen to God in our lives, and we can do that internally, and we can do that with and for each other as well. It doesn't have to be an either or. And I would also assume that even if you're going down the, the meditative solitary path, that it's not that you're not taking into account your life, which of course is filled with other people. So, no right, no wrong. Of course other people are going to be on this path and it just occurs to me that maybe we should be more intentional about that conversation. Or at least me being more intentional about giving you permission to do the thing that you're probably already doing, you just haven't told me about yet. That's okay too. The point, of course, is that however you process, internally or proclaiming your word from a mountaintop, our hope, my hope, is that your star word will lead you towards building community, deepening your relationship with God, and even leading you towards new destinations and understandings this year. So during communion, I will invite you to come forward and also to pick up a star word while you're up here. So communion, and then we're gonna try to figure it out. It may be a little chaotic, but maybe put your mask back on and then draw a card, grab and go. And if you are worshiping with us from afar, Please let us know you would like a star word and we will, put, we will draw one out for you prayerfully and then send it to you. And if you know, we've missed some people today, we will have them in the office and happy to draw them in the future week or as long as anybody wants one. May God lead you through star words towards each other and towards God's embrace to build a beautiful community right here.